Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course. And this module is on troubleshooting network connections. I'm James Messer, and I'll be your host for this module where we're going to talk about the requirements from CompTIA 220-601, section 5.3 where we need to explain status indicators, speed, connection, activity lights, wireless signal strength. But we also need to, from our Comp 20-602 exam, need to understand how to use tools and diagnostics procedures. So we're going to go through a lot of details on things you can do from the command line to help troubleshoot your network connection. We'll also talk about requirements from Section 5.4 of that 602 exam, where we're going to do preventive maintenance. We need to understand what we need to look at on the network to make sure everything maintains itself and is up and running whenever we need it. What we'll learn today deals with those status indicators we spoke of. We'll look at troubleshooting tools, both tools that are external and internal to our systems. Our diagnosing problems, I've got a list of problems here that we're going to diagnose from driver and network problems through permissions and all the way down to things like electrical interference. And then finally, we'll talk about preventive maintenance of networks and what you can do ongoing to keep that network up and running. One of the first things we'll start talking about is status indicators. It's a great first place to start because although it seems very obvious that if you want to see the status of something, you look to see if there's a bright light turned on. It's very often overlooked in the heat of a problem. People are trying to figure out where wires are going. They're tracking back different connections. One of the very obvious questions is, do we have a link light? Do we have connectivity? Ideally, when we plug in our network connection, both on the machine and on probably the network switch or the network router, a light is going to turn on. And that light is going to be green. It's going to be red. It's going to be orange. It's going to flash. It's going to stay, st stay solid. There's going to be something happening. And we need to both understand what those lights mean. And we also need to see if they're on or off. Very often, if you're having connectivity problems, you look down and there's no light then you're not connected. And there's the first place you should start is making sure we at least have a connection. Is it plugged in? It's a very simple question, but very often overlooked. There are also status indicators in your Windows desktop. You may not even have to look around to see if a light's turned on, because on the desktop, you can configure in your taskbar, in your tray, for there to be a little light there that comes on whenever it gets connectivity. It even flashes whenever there's network activity. And that can be very useful to be able to see, am I really connected to the network and is traffic really going back and forth? And as I mentioned, you've always got those lights on the hardware. If you aren't sure what those lights are and what they're doing, go back and reference the hardware documentation so that you understand and know if it's red, it means this. If it's yellow, it means something else. And if it's green, it means the third thing. Or it may just be that it's always green, and it may be on or off. So you need to check the documentation to make sure you know exactly what you should expect to see. Now that the obvious things are out of the way, let's start troubleshooting a little bit deeper. There are a number of tools we can look at. Some of them are very advanced tools that do cable testing. Here's an example of some of these that can provide you with detailed statistics about the electrical viability of this piece of copper. Or maybe we just want to see what the pinouts are on a particular link and a particular connection. Either way, these external cable testers can be really good just to give you a level check to make sure that the cable that you're using is something that's working properly. We can also look at the configuration inside of your computer and how it's configured to run on the network. If we've looked at our link configuration and we verify the cable's OK, maybe we'd need to look at how we've configured TCP IP. There's a command called ipconfig that gives you TCP IP configuration information for all of the adapters in your computer. There's another command that does an NS lookup. If we're on the network, but we're still not able to get to Google, we can perform a lookup locally from our command line that goes out to your name server, does the resolution, and presents you with the answer. So that, that's a good check to make sure that your DNS settings are set correctly. Sometimes those aren't right, and an NS lookup will tell you if that's the case. Let's do some examples of both of those. Let's start our command line. We'll click Start and Run and type CMD and hit Enter. So from our command line, I told you one of the first commands that we can do to check the configuration is called ipconfig. And this gives us, by itself, a very simple setup that says, here's your DNS suffix, here's the IP address you're running, here's your subnet mask, and here's your default gateway. Not much there at all. There are some other ipconfig commands there as well. However, and if we hit a ipconfig and type slash question mark, it will list out all the different options we have for us. There's so many, it goes beyond this particular screen. For instance, if we do ipconfig slash all, we'll get a list of everything. So I'm going to do an ipconfig slash all without a space. 
And it lists out a lot of things. In fact, it goes through so much that it goes by, again, an entire screen's worth of information. So this is my host name. Here's my node type. Is routing enabled? Is Wins proxy enabled? What's the suffix? And then I've got all this information for my local area connection. I can see the description of the card. I know its MAC address. I know if it has DHCP enabled. I can look at all the tiny configurations that are going to be really important when you get trying to troubleshoot DNS and WINS and IP addressing and subnet masking. And here it's all in one place with the ipconfig slash all command. I also told you there's that nslookup command. And if I type nslookup and hit Enter, it says that we can't find a server name for this. And that's normal for the configuration that I'm on right now because I'm on a private network. But it gives me a prompt that says it's now ready to start finding things. And from here, I can just start typing in names. If I type www.google.com, it's going to go out to my DNS server and then return back to me a list of all the IP addresses that it recognizes as being google.com. If I do www.yahoo.com, it's going to give me a different set of IP addresses. So this is checked for me to see where are you going. Let's give you, let's take the name you're trying to get to. Let me provide you with the IP address that's then going to allow you to get to that site. So I have confirmed from here that I am able to resolve names properly, which means all the programs that I use inside of Windows should also be able to resolve names properly. I should be able to launch my browser, type in www.google.com, and behind the scenes, it's going to do all this name lookup and then take me to the proper IP address for google.com. Now that we've checked our IP address and we've checked our DNS is working, we may want to check just to see if we have connectivity out to other devices on the network. A very simple way, a very common way to do this is with a program called Ping. Ping checks, sends a message out to a machine on the other side and checks to see if it's up. The other machine will then respond back with an answer. And as long as there's not any firewalling in place, we should normally get a response to the Ping. There's also a command called Traceroute. This takes a connection, assuming that you've got a lot of connectivity between you and the other device, and lists out for you all of the routers and connections that it takes to go from your connection all the way to the other device and back again. And as you've probably seen over the internet, that can be a number of hops away, a number of routers connecting between you and that other device. This tells you exactly which routers you're going through. And if you're trying to troubleshoot a connection or try to find out where am I losing my connection, I'm, I know my router's working, and I know the next router's working, where along the line is this conversation falling down, the trace route will tell you that information. There's also a Windows-specific program called Path Ping. It's not a very common one that's run, but it can combines a little bit of the ping and a little bit of the trace route to be able to give me something that's doing both of those at the same time. Uh, in practical use, it's best used if you're not going through firewalls. It can't handle that process very well. But if you're on an internal network and you just want to do a path ping through there, it's a very easy thing to do. From our command prompt again, let's run the ping command. A very common thing to do is to do an IP config so that you can find your default gateway. Because the default gateway is always a device, generally, that's external to your computer. And so a good check to see if we just have connectivity through the network is to type the ping command and then the IP address of your default gateway. In my case, the default gateway is 192.168.0.1. And if we hit Enter and we get a reply back, then what we know is that we've sent a packet out through our Ethernet connection across the network to a device that we know to be local to us, and it's responded back. Uh, for a little background on this, uh, there is a domain server, one of the big domain servers on the internet, that has an IP address that's used very often by people who are troubleshooting the network. That IP address is 4.2.2.2. And that IP address might change someday. But in the meantime, this is a tool that you'll find a lot of networking people use to see if they have connectivity all the way out over the internet to one of the major DNS servers and back again. So this ping command can be really useful. We can find out and ping if we local devices. We can go out and ping devices that are out across the internet and check to see if we are getting the kind of connectivity we would expect to get given our configuration. And we can also do a trace route. Trace route is that trace RT. And I'm going to use that same uh, IP address to that main DNS server, one of the main DNS servers out there. You can even see it put a name associated with that 4.2.2.2. And Traceroute may or may not give us feedback on certain hops through the network if there are firewalls in place that are blocking some of these conversations. Now, a lot of the information that comes back as it steps through all of these routers is, is very involved. There's a lot of big names. There's three, three sets as it goes through and does 
three checks on this link and given us information. But you can see we've gone all the way from our local network where my firewall was actually timing us out because I configure my firewall that way. But all of the other routers, we're hopping through each one of these routers out through Tallahassee, through Mobile, through Dallas, and then finally to this DNS server that apparently is somewhere in the Dallas area. Now that I have this information, if there happens, if we happen to lose connectivity to that main server and I do another trace route to 4.2.2.2, and it runs through this configuration again, and as it only gets to the Mobile Alabama router and then not any further, I know there must be a problem between Mobile and this Dallas router right here. So that I can now start troubleshooting my connection and contact people and say, I know it's not my local network. It's not even the network in my local area. It's somewhere else, and we can call in a ticket to help get that problem resolved. Once we're on the network, you may want to get an update of how things are running. Give me some status of what devices are out there, show me more connectivity. And for Windows, which uses NetBIOS over TCP IP to communicate, there's a specialized program called NBT Stat. And this is just a way to get information about Windows type devices across the network. There's a similar program called NetStat that gives us status information of how TCP IP is running on our device. Let's run both of these. I'll give you a feel for how they work. MBT stat is very extensive. It's used quite a lot for people who are administering Windows networks. Let's just type NBT stat and hit enter, and you'll see there's quite a bit that we can do. We can list a remote machine's name table. We can look at local NetBIOS names. We can list session tables. There's quite a lot going on here. And I can either do that out to other devices or I can do it to my own device. If we do MBT stat slash S to look at sessions, you can start to see who's connected to this device, where are they connecting to, uh, what type of in and out communication is going on, as to how much traffic is communicating between them. And it gives you a feel for exactly what's going on. Now, you can also have this update itself every few seconds. So if you want to just get a status of what's going on, this will put some information on the screen for you. Another command we mentioned was NetStat. And NetStat shows you at an IP level. This is outside of Microsoft Windows. This is at the TCP IP level. Who's connecting to you? How much traffic are they sending? There's quite a few options for NetStat as well. And you can choose to any of these command line options as you type it in to display different kinds of information. For instance, NetStat-R gives me a completely different list. This shows me my routing table for this device. So extremely detailed, very extensive commands. But if you're running into problems, you're trying to troubleshoot and get a status of what's going on, they're invaluable to have. When diagnosing networking problems, there's a number of steps you can go through depending on what the issue happens to be. If you're having an issue with the network interface itself, with just getting connectivity using your network card, check your device manager. First thing, see if your card is actually identified. Make sure that the hardware is working properly and that the correct driver has been loaded to be able to use that card. We also want to make sure we are running the latest drivers. For newer operating systems especially, if we're getting new versions of Linux and new versions of Windows coming in, make sure that you keep up to date because those drivers tend to change very rapidly. If your problem is you're on the network, the drivers are loaded, you're getting a link light, and you know you at least have some connectivity, there may be a problem with the way you've configured some of your protocols. So check the basic configurations of TCP IP and check with the person who provided you with the addressing. What's the IP address? What's the subnet mask? What's the gateway? What's the DNS? And double check those. You would be surprised how many times you type those things in, have them in the system, you realize you're not getting anywhere because you mistyped one of those numbers. So make make sure you've got the right ones and double check to make sure you've got the right ones. You may be surprised at how often you tend to make mistakes along those lines. These are the key pieces, your IP address, your subnet mask, your gateway, and your domain name server. Those are the four critical pieces that you want to be sure you've typed in properly or you're not going to be able to get out and surf the net. On Microsoft networks, there are so many options for setting permissions that it's very easy to accidentally misconfigure something that you need to get access to. The permission settings, though, are well laid out, and you can see them on the screen very easily. So sometimes it's an obvious error where you've accidentally denied it to everyone and therefore can't allow the access to someone else. This case can also be where there is permission type problems once the access is there. So if somebody doesn't have access to log into your machine, you can check your user list and make sure that they have accounts. And if they can't access the files once they log in, it's a permissions problem. So we need to check to see if they have the right permissions to that folder 
or to that set of files. Now, be careful when you start sharing these files. Whenever you're troubleshooting, you just want somebody to have access to a file. You can sometimes just say, forget access for just you. Let's just open it up to everybody while we're troubleshooting. Just remember that, because you're going to want to go back afterwards and tighten that up a bit. You don't just don't want to open up everything on your computer to everybody else who's out there. So the goal is to be as restrictive as possible. Make sure you understand about the permissions so that you're able to tighten down the configuration to just the access that people need and only to the people that need it. I configure software on computers all the time in some of the world's biggest networks. And it, even installing it on people who do this every day, we forget all the time that these local firewalls on people's machines can cause applications not to work. And so you have to almost get into the habit of checking the firewall configuration to make sure it's not blocking what you're trying to do. These To, to add on to this challenge, every operating system uses the local software firewall a little bit differently. And in some cases, the firewall configuration is even changing between service packs. You may have it turned off, and then a service pack might be loaded that by default turns it back on. So you can never be absolutely sure unless you go into your personal firewall and look at exactly the way it's configured. Because if you've got a separate program running that's not communicating out to a server, you're trying to figure out why. This could be a very simple change, and it's all contained in that firewall configuration. You don't see electrical interference problems a lot, but we're seeing it more and more now that we're doing more with wireless networks, since wireless networks are so susceptible to electrical types of interference. So you want to check your nearby sources. Are you using fluorescent lights? Is there a microwave oven in the facility? Are there a lot of people with mobile phones around that could be disrupting the problems that you're having? And we had a problem at one place where people were using the vacuum cleaner, and it was the motor inside of the vacuum cleaner that was feeding back some dirty electrical signal onto the line that was affecting other pieces of equipment that were on that same electrical circuit. So check those sources and make sure that the electrical systems that you have and the information that, that you see on your screen isn't being affected by some of these other sources around you. Some sources of electrical interference are not always obvious because they may be behind a wall, they may be created by something you can't see. It's obvious where there's a microwave oven. You can hear when a vacuum cleaner is going. But if it's a set of fluorescent lights that are on the other side of a wall, and yet your monitor is going crazy and you can't figure out why, it's because something that you can't see on the other side of that wall is causing your issue. And if you're sharing a building with other companies, you never are quite certain exactly what's going on around you. So be sure to check those things that aren't entirely obvious to you. From a networking perspective, the preventive maintenance generally revolves around your cabling. And you want to be sure that as you're putting cable up for the very first time that you, you put it there in a way that it's not going to crimp, it's not going to bend, it's not going to twist. I mentioned in another video, it's sometimes you'll walk into a person's office and they've pushed their desk all the way up against the wall where they're crimping the connection for the network. And they're complaining that they have no connectivity. Well, that's because they've bent the pins or they've bent the cable in such a way that it's not getting the electrical connection that it used to have. Now, all cables or wires or fibers have a maximum bend radius associated with them. You have to check the manufacturer specifications for this. But you can't just take a cable and wad it up and tie it up together. Most cables you tie in a circle because you don't want to extend the bend radius too far, or you're going to crack or fracture that networking media, whether it's copper or fiber or anything else. If you ever see a network cable delivered to you that has been twisted together and it's all folded up in one little piece, you know that there's perhaps a potential problem with that. The way that you want to store networking cabling of any kind is in a circle. That way you're going to be sure that you don't have a problem with the bend radius associated with that. In review, we've looked at status indicators, how we can troubleshoot not only using separate devices, but also from the command line. We've gone through best practices with diagnosing problems out on our network. And finally, we've looked at the preventive maintenance of our networks and our cabling in our environment. For more free a videos, for our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freeaplus.com.